اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم my dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته It's again a honor and a privilege for me to be spending another evening with you exploring some of the meanings of the Holy Quran and I extend my more warmest congratulations to all of you as we continue through the holy month of Rajab which is one of the uh, spiritually preparatory months for the month of Ramadan. We left off with uh, ayah number 19 so inshallah we'll pick up where we left off. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim qul أي شيء أكبر شهادة قل الله شهيد بيني وبينكم وأوحي إلي هذا القرآن لأنذركم به ومن بلغ أئنكم لتشهدون أن مع الله آلهة أخرى قل لا أشهد قل إنما هو إله واحد I'll read the translation and inshallah will commence with the commentary. The translation reads of ayah number 19 of Surah Al-An'am, Say, O Muhammad, what thing is greater as testimony? Say, God is is a witness between you and I. And this Quran has been revealed unto me that thereby I may warn you and whomsoever it reaches. Do you truly bear witness that there are other gods besides Allah? Say, I bear no such witness. Say, He is the only God, and truly I am innocent of what of, of that which you ascribe partners unto Him. Now, some of the Mufassireen of the Holy Qur'an have mentioned that again keeping in mind that this is a late meccan surah some of the mushrikeen of mecca approached the holy prophet and they said to him that O muhammad you've been preaching for almost a deck over a decade now and you're adamant that you are a messenger of god that you are divinely chosen so the mushrikeen they asked the Prophet, do you have anyone to bear witness that you are indeed a messenger of God? Do you have anyone to vouch for you? Do you have a credible witness? Someone who can come forward, someone who's credible in our eyes, who's trustworthy in our eyes, that can vouch for the claim that you are making? And they would say to the Holy Prophet that we reached out to the Jews and the Christians Ahlul Kitab, and we ask them about you, and they say that you are a false prophet, that you are a liar, that you are an imposter. So they present this to the Holy Prophet. They say that, do you have anyone to step forward as a witness to, a, to confirm that you are indeed a genuine prophet, that you're not a false prophet? Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He answers them. They're asking for someone to vouch for the Holy Prophet, someone to confirm that he is a true prophet. So Allah says, Qul, say to them, O Muhammad, What is, they say to him, what thing is greater as testimony? What is the greatest shahada? The Holy Prophet is instructed to tell them that you want someone to vouch for my truthfulness, for my credibility. Allah is my witness. 
Allah is the one who will vouch for me. So you find that the Holy Prophet is told that announce to them that I don't need anyone to step forward as a witness. I don't need mortals. I don't need human beings to vouch for me. My backer, my witness is the Lord of the worlds, is Allah Himself. And you find that when you study the Quran, there are several verses in the Quran that describe Allah Azza wa Jal as being a witness over His creation, over the people. In fact, one of the 99 names of Allah is a Shahid or a Shaheed, the one who witnesses. And I'll give you a couple of examples. If you go to Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, verse 98, Surah number 3, verse 98, Allah says, Qul ya ahl al -kitab, Say, O people of the book, which is a reference to the Jews and the Christians because they are recipients of divine revelation. Lima takfuruna bi ayatillah? Why do you belie the signs of God? Wallahu shaheedun ala ma ta'amaloon. For indeed, Allah is a witness over all that you do. You see, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very unique witness. Because you and I, we may witness something, an event. You may witness, for example, a murder. But you as a witness, you only see the zahir. As the Quran says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِّنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا You only see the external realities. You don't know, for example, what the murderer was thinking or what the motive was. You don't know the thoughts of that person. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says, I am a witness over what they do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in a unique position because not only does, is He familiar with the external events, the external occurrences, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also familiar with the thoughts, the intentions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He say in the Quran? Allah says, We know the whispers in the hearts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a unique witness. Because he knows the witnessed more than the witnessed knows himself. So when Allah says to Ahl al-Kitab that he knows and he is a witness over your actions, Allah is not just saying, I don't just see the external action. I also know the thought process behind the action. I know why you did it. I know why you, tempted, you were tempted to do such a thing. So Allah has full knowledge of what he is witnessing. So this is one example of Allah describing himself as a shaheed. And it's interesting, we refer to the martyr as a shaheed. In the Islamic tradition, someone who gives his life in the way of Allah, they're called shaheed. So what's the relationship between the act of witnessing and someone who has laid their life down for the sake of Allah? The ulama, they say, because a shaheed is able to lay his life down for the sake of Allah because he has witnessed the truth in such a profound way and the truth has penetrated deep into the heart of the person that they're willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. And other scholars say, no, the martyr is called shaheed because when the shaheed leaves this life, he immediately sees, he witnesses the reward that Allah has prepared for them. In any case, Allah is described as a witness. In some verses in the Quran, you find that anbiya, prophets, they invoke Allah as a witness between themselves and their wrongdoing people. For example, if you go to Surat Al-Ma'idah, Surah number 5, Ayah number 117. In fact, if you go to the Ayah before that, Ayah number 116, 
there is an interesting conversation between Allah Azza wa Jal and Nabi Isa on the Day of Judgment. So Allah gives us a glimpse into a conversation that will ensue on the Day of Judgment between him and Isa alayhi So if you look at ayah number 116, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ And when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّي إِلَاهَيْنِ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Allah is going to question Isa. Did you tell people to take yourself and your mother as gods other than Allah? Now you see Allah on the Day of Judgment, Allah knows the answer. He knows that Isa ibn Maryam is innocent, but Allah wants to make the truth known. He wants others to hear it. And this shows you that Allah doesn't have any special relationship with anyone, that there is a strict procedure on the Day of Judgment, a strict way to be exonerated on the Day of Judgment. Qala subhanak. What does Isa alayhi salam say? Qala subhanak ma yakunu li an aqula ma laysa li bihaq. Oh Allah, glory be to you. I have no I have not said such a thing nor do I have the right to make such a statement in kuntu qultuhu faqad alimta if I were to have said that I am God and my mother is a deity my mother is God you would have known it because you're a shaheed you're a witness over everything that transpires in kuntu qultuhu faqad alimta ta'lamu ma fi nafsi see Allah is not only a witness over actions Isa says, you know what is in my nafs. You know what's in my heart. You know what's in my mind. You know my inner thoughts. تَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِي وَلَا أَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِكِ You know me, but I don't know you in the way that you know me, O oh my Lord. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوبِ And then the next ayah. Isa says, he continues, مَا قُلْتُ لَهُمْ إِلَّا مَا أَمَرْتَنِي بِهِ O oh Allah, I didn't say to them, to Bani Israel, to my community, except that which you commanded me to say. What was Isa instructed to tell his, his community? <inaudible> to obey Allah, to fulfill your obligations, to refrain from that which Allah has forbidden. The underlying message, the underlying message of Isa throughout his life was ubudiyah to Allah, servitude to Allah. وَكُنْتُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا مَا دُمْتُ فِيهِمْ And I was a shaheed over them. I was a witness over them. You find that Allah is a shaheed and Allah delegates this position to His prophets. That The prophets are also witnesses over their people. Isa says, I was a witness over them. I was their guardian. I watched over them. I made sure... They didn't deviate as, as long as I was among them. مَا دُمْتُ فِيهِمْ فَلَمَّا تَوَفَّيْتَنِي كُنْتَ أَنْتَ الرَّقِيبَ عَلَيْهِمْ But when you terminated my stay in this life, when you ascended me into the heavens, you became the one who was watching them. وَأَنْتَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَيْءٍ And oh Allah, you are a witness over all things. So Isa being a witness, it was for a temporary period when he was on earth. But Allah being shaheed is constant. He's always a witness over our actions. So these mushrikeen, they ask, who is there to vouch for you that you are truthful, that you are indeed a messenger of God? Do you have a witness? Do you have a backer, someone to vouch for you? Allah tells the Prophet tell them that Allah is my shaheed. Allah is a witness. And what better witness is there other than Allah? So this ayah, the Prophet is invoking Allah as his witness, that he is truly a messenger. The second thing that is being invoked to confirm that the Holy Prophet is not a false prophet, is the Qur'an. Allah is my shaheed. He is my witness that I am speaking the truth. And my evidence for my claim is the Qur'an. 
وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ And this Qur'an, here, you see when the Qur'an is mentioned in the, in, in the Holy Qur'an, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to it with ism isharat al-ba'id. For example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Alif Lam Mim, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ ذَلِكَ is a demonstrative pronoun. It refers to something that is far. ذَلِكَ But here, the Holy Prophet is instructed to say, وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ You see, هَذَا is a demonstrative pronoun. And ذَلِكَ is also a demonstrative pronoun. What's the difference? You use the word هَذَا to refer to something that's close. So for example, this notebook is in my hand. I say هَذَا الدَّفْتَرِ Why? Because it's close, it's near, it's in close proximity to me. But if I want to refer to something that is distant, if there's a book on the bookshelf in the other room, I say ذَلِكَ kitab. Here, the Prophet is saying, this Qur'an was revealed to me. Meaning, the Quran, when Allah speaks about the eloquence and the greatness of the Qur'an, He uses ism ishara lil a demonstrative pronoun referring to something that is remote. But when Allah is speaking about the, ex the accessibility of the Qur'an, that you want to know if I'm a false prophet, the Qur'an is accessible to you. It's within your reach. وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ هَذَا is used here because it's referring to the accessibility of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is there. It's accessible to you. لِأُنذِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَمَنْ بَلَاغِ One of the functions of the Qur'an, one of the purposes of the revelation of the Qur'an is in dhar. It's warning. You find that the Qur'an is replete with glad tidings and warnings. But you may ask me, why does the Qur'an specifically mention warning and not bishara? Because as you know, the Qur'an describes itself as what? As being a book of glad tidings and a book of warning. So for example, if you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 97, Allah refers to the Qur'an as being a book of glad tidings, a book that has the promise of reward. Surah Al-Baqarah verse 97, قُلْ مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًّا لِجِبْرِيلٍ فَإِنَّهُ نَزَّلَهُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكِ Whoever is an enemy of Jibra'i, know that he has revealed it to your heart. بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ With Allah's permission. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ وَهُدًا وَبُشْرَى لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ The Qur'an is glad tidings, but for who? For the believers. In, in ayah number 19 of Surah Al-An'am, it, it reads, وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِأُنذِرَكُمْ بِهِ So I can warn you. Why? Because the audience, they're not believers. These are the mushrikeen who are taunting the Prophet, who are asking him for a witness, for someone to vouch for him. So here it's more suitable that they are warned because the audience Reje is rejecting the truth. You don't give glad tidings to mushrikeen, you give warning to the mushrikeen. وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِأُنذِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَمَنْ بَلَغْ You know, it's interesting, brothers and sisters, that if you go to Surah Al-Baqarah again, a lot of the references are Surah Al-Baqarah today. Surah Al-Baqarah verse 185. This is the famous Ramadan verse. In the month of Ramadan, we hear this verse recited over and over. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. It's interesting that from, the, from a Qur'anic perspective, you know, when you and I think of the month of Ramadan, the first word that comes to mind is what? Fasting. We associate Shahar Ramadan with fasting. It's almost as though they've become synonymous terms. Ramadan equals fasting. But, it's, but in the Qur'an, 
the month of Ramadan, it's linked to the Quran before it's even linked to fasting. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. And then there are three adjectives that are given to describe the Quran. Number one is Hudan Linnas. The Quran is what? A guidance for all people. It's not only a guidance for the Muslims. The Quran has universal appeal. It's a universal book. This is why when you look at ayah number 19 of Surat, Surat Al An'am, what does the Quran say? So I can warn you and whoever the Quran reaches, meaning the Quran is meant to go beyond the Arab lands. The Quran is not only for the Meccans. The Quran is not only revealed for the Arabs. The Prophet says, I'm warning you through the Quran. I'm warning you and whomever, whomsoever the Quran reaches. So the Quran is destined to reach all people. But how is the Quran going to reach all? Through you, through me. This is an amana that Allah has placed in our hands. So going back to Surah Al-Baqarah verse 185, three descriptions are given. Three adjectives. Quran is hudan linnas. It's revealed to all people. Now, if you want to share the Quran with non-Muslims and you tell them that this is the word of God, we Muslims believe the Quran is the literal word of Allah. Of course, they're going to ask you for proof. What's the proof? Second adjective in the ayah. What? Hudan linnas wa bayinat. Meaning, the Quran proves itself. You don't need anything external outside of the Quran to prove the Quran is divine. If the Quran is read with a sincere heart, with a desire to know the truth, the Quran will confirm itself. Hudan linnas wa bayinatin. Min al huda wal furqan. And then the third is it becomes a furqan. So Quran is for all. You share it with all people. They ask for evidence that it's the word of Allah. Quran is bayinat. It proves itself. Once you accept the Quran as the word of Allah, it becomes what? Guidance and furqan. It becomes a furqan for you, meaning it becomes a criterion. It allows you to distinguish between right and wrong once you embrace the Quran as the word of Allah. Now, going back to this, this word, these two words, وَمَنْ بَلَغْ وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِأُنذِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَمَنْ بَلَغْ So this, as I mentioned, indicates that the Quran has universal appeal that is operative beyond the Holy Prophet's own community. Now, when the Quran says, the Quran is a warning to you and to whomsoever it reaches, it doesn't mean that if you drop off the Quran in the hands of a friend, you've delivered the Quran to them. That's not what Allah is saying. For Quran to really reach people, it has to be presented to them correctly. Because there are many people who, re who read the Qur'an and, for example, they may be exposed to deviant commentaries. So for the Qur'an to reach people, it has to be explained and extrapolated. So for example, there's a beautiful hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi where he says to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Ali, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِمَّا طَلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسِ Oh Ali, if Allah guides one person through you, it's better than anything that the sun shines on. Delivering Islam to, uh, to others doesn't just mean you hand them a copy of the Qur'an. That's not enough. It's not enough. Because there are many who may receive a copy of the Qur'an, but in addition to that, they need someone to guide them through the Qur'an. They need to be exposed to 
the interpretation of the Ahlul Bayt. So you can't say that these people, for example, are kuffar because they've rejected the Quran even after I handed them a copy of the Quran. Waman balagh means that Quran has been comprehensively delivered to them. It's the, the Islam, the Quran of Ahlul Bayt has been delivered to them. So, وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِأُنذِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَمَنْ بَلَغْ This وَمَنْ بَلَغْ is a responsibility that falls upon our shoulders. And delivering the Qur'an, again, is not just handing copies of the Qur'an. You yourself, as a Muslim, you have to become a walking Qur'an. The most powerful Qur'an is you. You have to exemplify the teachings of the Qur'an. You find that after the death of the Holy Prophet, one of the Tabi'een, the Tabi'een, they're the second generation Muslims. One of the Tabi'een asked one of the wives of the Prophet. This individual wanted to know what was the secret behind the Prophet's power and his ability to influence people and his ability to transform people. She said to him, so this man is asking, describe the Prophet to me. This wife of the Holy Prophet, she says, كانت أخلاقه القرآن. If you want the most accurate description of the Prophet, you want to know about his akhlaq, his mannerism, his character, his mannerism and his character was the Quran. He was the Quran in action. So if we want Quran to reach the masses, we have to take this Quran and translate it into action. We have one official copy of the Quran, right? But ideally there should be one and a half billion walking Qurans. This is when we can truly say that the Quran has reached all people. You have to become a physical walking representation of the Holy Quran. The ayah continues. The Prophet at the end of this verse is asked, is told to ask the mushrikeen. أَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَشْهَدُونَ أَنَّ مَعَ اللَّهِ آلِهَةً أُخْرَى قُلْ لَا أَشْهَدْ The Prophet says, is instructed to, to ask the following question to the mushrikeen, these idol worshippers, these polytheists. Do you really believe, do you truly bear witness that there are other gods besides God? This question, brothers and sisters, is meant to awaken the fitrah. That do you really think that there is, there is another deity other than the creator of the heavens and the earth? Brothers and sisters, there is a beautiful hadith that I was actually reading earlier today. It's actually mentioned in Nahj al balagha where Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi, he says to his son, Imam al-Mujtaba, he says, Ya Abu, he's speaking about Tawheed and how obvious Tawheed is. He says, Ya Abu Nay, law kana li rabbika shariq, لَأَتَتْكَ رُسُلُهُ Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Oh my son, my beloved son. And by the way, the, the word bunay is a term of endearment. You find Ahlul Bayt, you find Anbiya, prophets. Whenever they speak to their children, they use this bunay. The prophets, they were very compassionate. They had so much love in their hearts. And they would affirm their love for their children verbally. They would vocalize it. Some parents, they never express love towards their children. They say, oh, my kids know that I love them. Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he speaks to Imam al-Hazr, says, Ya Bunay, oh, my beloved son. Ya Bunay, law kana li rabbika shariq, la atatka rusulu. Oh, my beloved son, if your Lord had partners, they would have sent messengers. But if you look at history, from Adam to Nuh to Ibrahim to Musa, all of the messengers speak on behalf of one God. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, if there were other gods along with Allah, 
there would have been messengers who, have, who would have been sent. We would have seen generation after generation prophets, messengers, who were being dispatched on behalf of those gods. And you would have witnessed the effects and the signs of their kingdom and their authority. And you would be familiar with their actions and their attributes. Meaning if there were multiple gods, there would be signs of it. But what do you see? There is the signature of Tawheed in everything from the subatomic particle to the largest galaxy. You see, even if you look at a, uh, an atom, the design of the atom resembles the design of the galaxy. It's the same design. If you look at living things, they're all comprised of cells. If you look at matter, they're all made up, all, they're all made of atoms. You see that there is a consistent design throughout the cosmos. So the creator of the, ga the, the large galaxy is the same as the creator of the atom. Imam, he says, but indeed, Allah is one as he has described himself. The word ilah is an interesting word in the Arabic language. If you look at most translations, you know the, the shahada that we recite when we say la ilaha illallah, what's the translation that's often given? There is no God other than Allah. La ilaha illallah. But the word ilah is a, is a very deep word. In fact, there is no single word in the English language that can do justice to the word ilah. Because the Prophet is asking them, Do you really believe that there are aliha, which is the plural of ilah, alongside Allah? The word ilah comes from a verb. It comes from a number of verbs. One of the meanings of ilah is that it comes from the verb aliha, which means to seek refuge in something. You seek, you, you seek refuge in something to find peace and tranquility. So if you understand ilah as being derived from the verb, which means to seek refuge, you're saying essentially there is no place of refuge, there is no place of tranquility, there is no place of safety and peace other than Allah. And this is true, brothers and sisters. Have you seen individuals who spend their entire lives accumulating wealth what happens to them after they get a good job and they make money and they live in a a nice house and they drive a fancy car and they're married to a, an attractive spouse and they have their kids and they they go on their vacations what happens to most of these people they have a midlife crisis they become depressed if you don't believe me go look at hollywood all of these celebrities with all of their money Many of them are on antidepressants. Why? Because they made their ilah money. Allah says the only place of refuge, the only place of peace, the only place you're going to find tranquility is with me. And Allah in Surah Taha, what does he say? Ayah number 124. Whoever turns away from my remembrance, they're going to suffer. Not Forget about akhirah. You're going to suffer in dunya. You're going to be distressed because your heart was designed to yearn for Allah. If you direct your heart to anything other than Allah, it's going to break. You're going to feel disturbed. You're going to feel uneasy. You're not going to find that happiness. You see, shirk, brothers and sisters, is so damaging that the Holy Prophet does bara'a. He disassociates himself from that which the polytheists ascribe to Allah. 
Shirk is so severe that Rasulullah does bara'a from it. If you look at Surah Luqman, Surah number 31, Luqman alayhi salam, he says to his son, the first advice that he gives him, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِظُ Luqman says to his son while he's advising him, Ya Bunay, again, a term of endearment is used. You know, when you want to advise your children, you don't yell at them, you don't scream at them. You have to speak to them in a way that they understand that what you're saying to them is coming from a place of love. Ya Bunay, la tushrik billah. Don't ascribe partners to Allah. You notice, he doesn't just stop there. When you teach religion, you have to give a reason. Why should I not ascribe partners with Allah? Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. He gives the illa, he gives the reason. Because shirk is a great injustice. To who? To yourself. You doing shirk doesn't harm Allah. When you ascribe partners with Allah, when you direct yourself to anything other than Allah, you're doing dhulm against who? Against yourself. You are the one who is being harmed. So you find that shirk is such a dangerous crime. It's so damaging to the soul of the human being because brothers and sisters, you have to understand that tawheed is not just an idea in our minds. Tawheed is something very real outside. Everything in the universe is created and, and arranged in a way that it is yearning for Allah. It wants Allah. It seeks Him. Everything is doing tasbih to Him. In fact, everything in creation is moving towards Him. So directing yourself to other than Allah means that you're swimming against the current of creation. So the punishment... For shirk is what? It's self-inflicted. It's not that you commit shirk and Allah is punishing you. No, that's the nature of shirk. When you swim against the current, what happens to you? You get tired. You become exhausted. Have you been swimming? If you swim against the wave, what happens to you? You can't get anywhere. You're getting, you're getting thrown left and right and you become very exhausted. But if you swim with the current, you move smoothly. And the current is what? The current of the universe is La ilaha illallah. So when you direct yourself to Allah, you're in unison with every particle in the universe. This is true about the external world, and this is also true about the heart. Fitratallah allati fatra nas This is, you were created to yearn for Him, to seek Him. If we go to the next ayah, so ayah number 19, the Prophet is being asked to produce a witness to confirm that he is a true Prophet. The Mushrikeen, they say, we spoke to the Jews and the Christians, and they say that you're a false Prophet. Ayah number 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes some of the people of Ahlul Kitab. And only Allah can do this, because Allah knows what people conceal in their hearts. They may say that he's not a prophet, but Allah says, I know them very well. Ayah number 20. By the way, as I mentioned, Ahlul Kitab, it refers to the Jews and the Christians. Notice Allah doesn't say Ahlul Kitabain, because we're talking about Tawrat and Injil. But here, Kitab is a generic term used to reference any revelation, any divine scripture. Because they're recipients of divine revelation. Those unto whom we gave the book, whether it's the Torah or the Injil. Amazing. Allah says, they don't want to bear witness that you are a true prophet 
Allah is saying many of them, they're not ignorant. They may be excused if they were ignorant. But Allah says, they know you. They know Muhammad as well as they know their own children. Have you seen parents? Parents know their kids, right? Every mother knows her child. Every father knows its child. Allah is saying that these rabbis and these priests, not only do they know that the prophet is a true prophet, they know him so well. They know his qualities, his characteristics, his mannerism. They even know some of the markings on his physical body. They know the Prophet. You know, with your kids, believe me, you know every scratch that's on their bodies. Allah is saying these rabbis and these priests, they know Muhammad in the same way that parents know their children. That's how familiar they are with him. And this is why many Jews settled in the Arabian Peninsula. That's why many of them were living in Arabia, because it was written in their scriptures that the final messenger of God would emerge from the Arab lands. So they were waiting there in anticipation for this final messenger of Allah. But what happened? When they discovered it was Muhammad, son of Abdullah, who's from the lineage of Ismail, they rejected him because they were hoping that the final messenger of Allah would be from what line? From the line of Ishaq, from the line of Ya'qub. He would be an Israelite. When they saw that he's from the line of Ismail, they rejected him and they turned away. But you find that Salman, Salman al Farisi, many of you may be familiar with the story of Salman al Farisi. Salman al Farisi was born into a Zoroastrian family. They used to worship fire. And at the age of 16, he had studied the Zoroastrian faith until he became a priest in the Zoroastrian temples. But there was still something that was empty inside of him. So one day, he passes by a church and he meets with the priest and he becomes interested in Christianity and eventually he converts to Christianity. Salman al Farisi was Zoroastrian and then he became Christian. He returned home and he told his father that I believe there is more haq, there is more truth in the Christian faith. And I have decided to join the Christian faith. Salman al Farisi's father imprisoned him, he threw him in prison. Salman, he escapes and he travels to Sham. He goes to Sham and he decides to study and he meets with the head bishop in Sham and he studies many years. He goes from region to region and he becomes a scholar in his own right until he meets a scholar who reveals to him some of the prophecies of the final messenger of God. So Salman decides that he wants to go to Mecca. He wants to go to Mecca. So he joins a caravan. Again, he's Persian. He's probably not able to speak Arabic very fluently. The, the owner of the caravan, they decide to betray him and they sell him into slavery. They say that he's a slave. And he's purchased by a Jewish merchant from Yathrib, which is the ancient name of Medina. Salman al Farisi ends up in the city of Medina as a slave. He's owned by a Jewish merchant. Rasulullah is in Mecca. His hijrah is to where? Subhanallah, when Allah wants to guide you, He arranges things for you. Rasulullah does a hijrah to Yathrib, to Medina. Salman hears that this new prophet has left Mecca and he has entered Medina. So the man that Salman has been searching for for many years, traveling from village to village, city to city, he's now in the same city as this final prophet. So he decides one day to go meet 
his master gives him some errands, he decides to go meet Rasulullah. And Salman was a scholar, he knew what was recorded in the scriptures. So he was able to test Rasulullah to see if he's a true prophet or not. He sees Rasulullah sitting with his Sahaba and he's car he carries some dates. He approaches the Holy Prophet and he says, I would like to offer you these dates as sadaqah. I want to give some charity. Here are some dates as sadaqah. Rasulullah says, I do not accept sadaqah. Salman knew that this is one of the signs that the final messenger of God doesn't accept charity. So he comes back after a short while and he presents these dates as a gift. First time was sadaqah, second time was hadiyah. The Prophet accepts it. Salman asks to see a marking on the body of the Prophet. You know, this is what the Quran says. He sees the seal, this marking on the body of the Prophet, and he embraces Islam on the spot. Why? Because he read, he studied what was what was recorded in their scriptures. Even the physical qualities of the Prophet were described in some of the passages. And you find that Salman was a slave. Rasulullah says, how much does your master want for your freedom? He wanted 300 palm trees to be planted. Rasulullah tells his companions, go, let us come together and plant three date palms so Salman can be liberated and he can join us. This is, this is real love, brothers and sisters, to have a yearning for the truth that you, you choose a faith that makes you unpopular even with your family. You're willing to endure all of this hardship, all of this travel for the sake of haq. You and I, we have the truth at our fingertips, but we're lazy. Salman is an inspiration to us that we, the journey, the search for truth, should be continuous. So Allah says, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُمْ They knew the Holy Prophet. Inshallah, I think the next verses we'll have to leave them for, for next week. So uh, we'll inshallah open up the floor for, uh, for Q&A. وَصَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Um, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that uh, all of us need to become a walking Quran. No. Um, so this is great. Um, so now I'm, I'm trying to get something actionable out of this today. Um, so if you would, um, if you would uh, list down all the issues that you see, maybe the ethical issues you see among uh, Muslim. Uh, people, uh, especially in this country, um, what would be on the top of the list um, that you would suggest to, to go for <coughs> and do corrections? My recommendation is for all Muslims to study Surah Al-Hujurat. Because Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah number 49 of the Quran, the ulama, they refer to it as Surah Al-Akhlaq. The problem with many Muslims is what? We pray, we fast, but when we sit together, what happens? We backbite. We don't give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't ask about the well-being of our neighbors. These social issues, this social etiquette needs to be addressed. You know, today I was listening to one of the ulama who was speaking about the right of the neighbor. One of the companions of the Prophet, I mean, just to shows you the, the elevated spirituality of these people. One of the companions of the Prophet, every day used to go outside and sprinkle breadcrumbs on an anthill that was close to his house. Some people asked him, what's the matter with you? Why every day you come and you sprinkle bread near this anthill? He says, I'm afraid on the day of Qiyamah that these tiny creatures will complain to Allah that I went to bed full and I left them hungry. They are my neighbors. Imagine we were able to have this type of, 
this level of ethics. So I think that backbiting, not giving people the benefit of the doubt, being suspicious of people, not being forgiving. You know, we speak so much about the forgiving nature of Ahlul Bayt until someone crosses us, right? I think we have to really refocus on akhlaq. The reason why Rasulullah was so effective was because of his akhlaq. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ As the Qur'an says, O oh Muhammad, if you were harsh with people, they would run away from you. Which means what? What attracted people to the Holy Prophet, to Islam, was the softness, was the gentleness, was the mercy. So I think that we have to develop our akhlaq with our families, with our relatives, with our colleagues, with even perfect strangers. We have to have, we have to be courteous, we have to be compassionate. I think if we do that, forget about being a walking Quran. If you're a walking Surat Al Hujurat, we'll be light years ahead of the world. So my recommendation is go through Surat Al Hujurat and look at the the moral directives that are given about the way you deal with your family, the way you deal with the community, what you should avoid what you should focus on. So I think that akhlaq is really a big, a big issue that we have to focus on. Thank you, Mulan. Mulan, just uh, this thing on uh, shahada, that you talk about shaheed, that's kind of um, confusing me a bit because uh, when you call, uh, the explanation you provided for shaheed, so there are people who go to they, they meet dead because they know willingly they go, uh, let's say, to fight and they know they can die. So that's a shaheed who goes into the battlefield knowing that he can die. So he's fighting the truth. But there are also those people who are um, uh, called shaheed and they happen to be on the right. Let, let's say there's a bomb blast in a procession basically in Muharram. Mm. So they're on the right path, but they were not going, they didn't go there to die. Or they didn't think of that they there will be a blast. So, so all the people who die became shaheed, but they're all those who live. But they are also basically were on the same path. So, the, the question is that: Would you say that these guys, um, uh, the expression provided for the shaheed that they um, saw the truth or something? Would you say the same for these guys? Those who those who die like in a bomb bomb blast, you mean? Yeah, because they didn't really go there. They were not really fighting anyone. They just happened to be there in the wrong place. Yeah, again, not not everybody who who dies in the battlefield is considered shaheed. You know, externally it looks like yeah. They, I mean, if you look at one of the battles of Islam, there was one of the companions of the Prophet who fell in the battlefield and was killed in one of the battles. Many of the Muslims they were calling him shaheed. Rasulullah says he's not shaheed, he's shaheed al-himar, he's the shaheed of the donkey. Because he saw a donkey on the other side and he was trying to maneuver to get to it. So you find that it's not about, it's not about the end result of you know, who falls in the battlefield. It's about, you know, it's about because even in, even in jihad, if, 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 the, if there is a jihad that takes place, Jihad is, if you, is it's, it's, one, it's one of the ibadat. It requires niyya, the proper niyya of qurbatan in Allah. So just like someone may pray, but they might be praying riya'an, they might be praying to seek praise, this salah doesn't have value. Similarly, someone who's fighting for worldly gain, or they're not fighting for the sake of Allah, they could, they're not necessarily considered, they're not considered shuhada. So it depends on the, the spirituality of the person, the intention of the person. I think what you're trying to say is that basically, we don't know who really the shaheed is, if that person is shaheed or not. We, re we really don't know, only Allah knows. Well, and I have another question um, about um, Ayah 19. And as you said, Allah is the best witness. He, is, uh, he witnesses not only the, the external reality, but also our thoughts. No. Um, so um, we usually are paying a lot of attention about our actions, 
Mm. Um, but I think we are paying less attention to our thoughts. Um, so now my question is, how can we move to a, to a position where we give shaitan less and less room to play with us in our thoughts, not only in our actions? Mm. It's an, that's an excellent question. You know, I, I think it's a process. I think that, you know, first you have to make sure that none of your actions are satanic. You know, you cannot treat satanic thoughts unless you treat satanic actions. Once your actions become angelic and they, they become godly, only then can you, can you start treating the thoughts. And a lot of that comes from dhikr. This is why dhikr is so important. If you look at all of the Islamic obligations, there is usually a limit that's prescribed. Praying five times a day, fasting one month, hajj once in a lifetime. But dhikr, there is no cap. There is no limit to dhikr. Ya dhikran Remember Allah abundantly. When you train yourself to always be engaged in dhikr, immediately that is a very powerful way of cleansing the mind from satanic thoughts. So training yourself to be engaged in, uh, in dhikr is the best way to, to train, to purify your, uh, your thoughts. And make, make, a, uh, make a, a conscious effort. You know, I, I think it's important for us that when we wake up in the morning, you make a resolution that today I'm not going to disobey Allah. And when you're able to achieve that, take it up a notch and say, today I'm not going to think about committing a sin. So I think that you gradually have to set those rules. And even writing them down and maybe posting them on the fridge or in your room just so you, you, you see it is a step in the right direction. Because it's, you're more likely to commit to a goal if you write it down. So first commit to refraining from satanic actions, from haram actions, and then you can move on to a, a higher level of, of purity, and, by, and that's through purification of, uh, of thoughts. But that's, I mean, you're talking about a very, very high station. I mean, it, it, it takes a lifetime to, el to elevate yourself to a point where you don't even think about committing haram. It's very, very difficult. But it's doable. Again, shaitan always wants to convince you that it's impossible. It's not impossible. It's difficult. But with Allah's help and with dua, you know, there's a hadith from Imam al-Baqarah that says, there are certain levels of iman that cannot be reached except through dua. Sometimes you have to ask Allah to elevate you. It's not just about your effort. It's about the tawfiq that you get through divine grace, that Allah gives you that, that extra push. Thank you, Molana. Um, so a follow-up question from the sisters is, um, when you say zikr, when the Quran says zikr, is there a specific zikr that is, uh, that is recommended? Or is that just in general, the, our, yeah, you know, our... Uh, you know, this dhikr, you know, we have a tradition from Imam Sadiq where he says what qualifies as a dhikr al kathir is the tasbih of Fatima al Zahra. Tasbih al Zahra is min al dhikr al kathir. But dhikr of Allah doesn't necessarily have to be a formal supplication or dhikr that's given to us by the Ahlul Bayt. Of course, the adhkar of Ahlul Bayt, it's the best because they have the highest ma'rifah of Allah. But I think it's important for us to get into the habit of talking to Allah outside of our daily prayers. Most of us, we only speak to Allah when we pray. We need to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a part of our lives outside of prayer. When you wake up in the morning, speak to Him. When you're in your car, talk to Him. It's not, it's not important what you say necessarily. What's important is that line of communication is open. Because you can't develop a relationship with a being if you don't talk to them. And I think this informal dua is very important. Even if you have nothing to say, say, oh Allah, I have nothing to say right now. Speak to him as though you would speak to a friend. It's very important to get into the habit of communicating regularly with Allah. Express to him your frustrations, your hopes, your aspirations. Talk to him. In the same way, if you have a roommate, 
You have conversation, you have small talk. Have small talk with Allah. And the relationship will build and build and build. Thank you very much for your guidance and responding on the, the secrets of the Quran, inshallah. We yeah, Allah bless you. Thank you, Zakazah. Ah, Sentiment, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll meet again next week with Allah's permission. Allah's permission.